Hey gamers, it's your buddy Work. I'm back again, it's been a long time. Uh, wanted to make this video log to wrap up our Tomb of Annihilation campaign. That's for D&D 5th edition. Uh, we made it all the way through our Tomb of Annihilation campaign after uh, Lost Mine and Fandelver made it all the way through that. So I know that that's a very special, rare thing uh, to be able to put a group together. I think that says a lot about our group and the people that are in it and uh, the quality of the content that we're running. So I just wanted to go ahead and make this log. I am super late making the log. Super duper late. That's why I've been so gone for so long. Um, we delayed the last game. <sighs> We'd started it around, we were going to have it November. We were going to have it after Thanksgiving. That got canceled. Then we were going to have it in December, and that got delayed, but we still had the December session. Then we were going to have it, is that right? Uh, there were several delays in there. At one point, I was going to have uh, all my buddies in after the Thanksgiving game to help play the NPCs, and it was going to be a big battle royale, and then someone got sick and couldn't be there, so we postponed the game. We ended it, our last session, I think it was in January, we, we we finished. And then it's been a couple of months since I posted a video log. And, you know, just different things get in the way. There's all kinds of stuff going on, uh, as everybody does. But I'm about to start a new campaign tomorrow. So before I start the new campaign, I wanted to put a period on the end of this last campaign, kind of put it to rest, present the information to you all, and uh, hopefully move forward. Also, I hope to post maybe three videos this weekend. Um, you know, this last one uh, before the session for uh, the Turn of Fortune Wheel and after the campaign after the adventure tomorrow. Uh, we'll see how that goes. That usually helps the algorithm. Uh, speaking of the algorithm, don't forget to like and subscribe and post comments and you know kiss your phone and praise the Google gods. Anything you want to do that you think might help me out, I'm all about that. I don't get a whole lot of views. <laughs> so uh, anything you can do, I really appreciate it. Uh, so Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb of Annihilation, I think we started it at level 5, maybe level 6. So we started it, and uh, I pretty much always have 4 players. At one point I got up to 5, and then we ended all the way down at 3. So that's kind of what we were doing. I think uh, going into it, I knew there was going to be a lot of traps, because I had played Tomb of Horrors before. So I was kind of expecting a Tomb of Horror-esque sort of dungeon crawl at the end. So I kind of front-loaded the campaign with a thief rogue. He had a little more than we needed. Um, he, he didn't, he never missed anything. He never, nothing was a challenge, which was really kind of my problem. And it was also because I, I was afraid of the party getting wiped. So I had them coming in a little, possibly, possibly, it's hard to say really, possibly, maybe a little over leveled. But it all went really well. Um, so we got to that last, that last session. My greatest concern going into that was that the party was going to mess with the Mechanist chain. The Mechanist chain had like 16 Modrons and they were like Quadrons and Septon. It was, it would have been bad. Like it would have been bad, bad. And at one point they got to it and I explained, you know, the hallways were offset with the chain going in between and you could get, you know, from one side to the other, but then going back would be a challenge and that the chain's going up and down, you know, it's like a grandfather clock chain and, and, they, and they looked at it and they were like, mm, let's go back. So that was the session where we kind of, that's probably the last video log, was where they went back and completed a lot of stuff and I couldn't really figure out why. And they were I think they were just hoping for something that would make it all make sense. 
or something that would tell them they were done, or something that would tell them they were prepared. Like I, I like they were, they needed a sign. Like they wanted something, and there just really, there really wasn't anything. So they went through and basically wore themselves out more and made the next encounter even more difficult, which is not exactly ideal. But uh, they came back and um, decided that they didn't have any alternative. They had to go down and deal with the hags because they couldn't rest anymore. They exhausted all of those uh, uh, alter uh, opportunities. They, they couldn't do anything. So they went down to the hags, and this is like the last room before the, the last, I don't know, kind of cluster of adventure or whatever before you get into the boss battle. So they already had all the skeleton keys. They already had all of that stuff. They go into that room, and um, at one point, whenever I was going to have uh, different friends come in and play the NPCs, uh, one of those was Nick, who was a player when we were in Port Nianzaru. He was playing a wizard named Wayne. Um, we had some great moments with him. That was really good. Uh, those two sessions are why I recommended him for the other group, and we're having fun over there. So Nick was able to play like the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and I was very excited to have Nick in, so I put the wizard in the, the hag's cage. So I just put the wizard in there like on Death's Door, like the actual wizard, like not a clone of him or a simulacra, but like actually Wayne, beat up Wayne was in the, was in the uh, cage. They talked to the creepy dolls. They actually liked the creepy dolls. The creepy dolls liked them. They did all of the rooms. I think it's six. They did the six rooms to unlock the skeleton door. Um, you know, of all the shapes uh, to open up the key slots. And um, before they opened the door, they were attacked by the hags. At one point, the doll that can make you ethereal uh, made, I don't remember now, made someone ethereal, I think it was uh, the Barbarian, made them ethereal, and they could see the hags all, like, huddled in the corner, like they were all, like, super creepy Blair Witch huddled in the corner, like, waiting for them, waiting for something. And they they didn't do anything with them, they used the etherealness, they actually kind of figured out my weird world's etherealness and the ethereal plane and kind of how it works and got to play with that. That was kind of neat. Then they got, like, they used that a couple of times to help with the challenges. They got all of the challenges done. And then whenever it was time to open up the the gate, they, they while they were opening the gate, they got uh, ambushed by the hags. So the hag fight... I had decided, because again, I had a long time to prepare for this fight. I had decided that the hags wouldn't be, wouldn't utilize the most effective tactics. I decided that the hags, despite being incredible outer planar monsters, were not going to go, not going to face the party at their maximum potential. So the way that I, the, the, kind of the way that I did that was I, I kind of, I sort of had them fight in waves. I didn't really have them focus fire. I, I used their original spell list. I didn't change their spell list at all. Um, the one thing I did with the, the party focus fire and kind of brought down one hag pretty quick. And then... I had the one hag cast haste on another one, and they were doing their thing, and the party had the the hag that was concentrating on haste somewhat cornered, and she dropped the haste concentration. So that exhausted the other hag, which gave the party some advantage, and, and they did a pretty good job. Uh, I think maybe one character went down and they were able to get them back up pretty quickly. So once the hags were killed, they were able to rest. 
The party rested, they prepared, they attuned, they did anything and everything that they had been waiting to do for sessions, <laughs> sessions after sessions. So they were very, uh, very primed and ready to go. They open the skeleton door, they go down, they see the whole scene with the Atropal. So at this time, we have our three players, and the three players' characters were Uriel the Rogue Thief, we had uh, Alicia was playing um, Stemma, who was a drow druid, Circle of the Stars, and uh, Gabe, who was playing uh, Tien, who was a orc barbarian. So we had those were the three main characters, but then we had three NPCs. So we had the human wizard Wayne, we had um, Lucanu, the the human, the Amawan, uh champion, and then we had another, we had another, oh, it was the, the guy that, that ghosted us, we were playing his dragon, dragonborn sorcerer, so we had six characters actually going in there, even though it was played by three players, so everybody was playing two players, like their main player, and then, uh, just a, an NPC, so they go in there. Wayne didn't have his full spell book, so he was kind of handicapped. But we go in there. No, that's not right. There was another character. that Wayne, I had Wayne bow out because he didn't have spells. There was another, like a fighter type of some kind. Man, it's been a long time. It's been a long time since we've played that. I mean, it's been a couple of months at this point. It's the middle of March right now, going into late March. It's actually spring. Can't tell it. We got six inches of snow this weekend. Gotta love West Michigan. Uh, so, the, yeah, there was another character. Man, I don't remember it. So we had the, the, the Dragonborn Sorcerer, Lucanu, and... Somebody else. I think they were like a fighter type or something. So they go in there. They see the three adamantine pillars with the eye beams going out, connecting to the soul catcher, right? The soul catcher's there. That's the whole thing's the soul monger. You got the, the atropal. It's connected to it with an umbilicus. It's like this whole thing. Uh, I built, <laughs> I, I got one of my daughter's dolls. It was like a little doll with a giant head. And I'm like, that's the atropal. So we had that. I took uh, masking tape and like folded it over and folded it over and folded it over. And those were like the tentacles that were attached to the soul monger that it used to defend itself. Like I had it all drawn out. It, it was good. They came in, they started fighting, uh, the first that, oh, Bo, that's who I'm forgetting, Bo, so Dayton's character, Bo, so we had two characters that were left behind by players that went on to greater things, and, uh, you know, actual NPC Lucanu that we got out of the mirror of life trapping or whatever it was, so Bo, who everybody everybody loves Bo. Bo's been there the whole time. He's a cleric of Jurgle, the Death God. So he's a, a a death cleric trying to kill the Soulmonger and and fix the death curse. Right? He's been sent on a mission from God. He's the chosen of his God that walks for Rune. So he and um, and Uriel the Rogue. Those were the the, the like the, like I I had at the beginning of Tomb of Annihilation. Bo went and found Uriel and was like, my God told me to find you because we have to do something. We're going to save the world. So whenever they went in there, having rested, and um, Gabe was playing Bo, and as soon as he saw this twisted, dead, kind of zombie-looking, giant fetus thing, he was like divine he he what is this divine intervention so he had divine intervention in his pocket this whole time he got to a high enough level that he had divine intervention and he was like jurgle this is what you've sent me for this is why we're here i beg of you please 
please judge this abomination and inter it into like the death that it correctly deserves or what basically like like did what Jurgle's supposed to do so i'm like okay what the fuck am i gonna do with this so uh i basically i said that it like three disintegration rays came out of Bo's hand or Bo's holy symbol and zapped the atropal. So those three disintegration rays were enough. I just said like a burn giant holes through its head and a giant hole through its shoulder and a giant hole through its hip. And like the baby like screamed and it's cursing and infernal and all of this stuff. So it didn't kill it, but it did a crap ton of damage. Um, so they very easily finished off the Atropal. It's a, a an outsider, so whenever they reduced it to zero, it's gone, right? Back to the astral or whatever, but it's not having a good time. So they're like, eh, all right. So the the umbilical's still flying around and it's spraying souls everywhere and the whole place is shaking and the lava's boiling and bubbling up and slapping around and this is fine. So they start looking around <laughs> and all the to tormented souls and the tornado and the soul monger and everything. Hmm, yeah, I'll go check out those phylacteries. So they go up and they check out the phylacteries. And, yeah, and I'm describing this one looks like this and this one looks like that. And this one's got hieroglyphics all over it. And this one's just carved in rude triangles. And this, uh, you know, this one's a beautiful gold inlaid with, with gemstones, like a coffin. And this was just, there's just a, a ton of urns and boxes and just all kinds of, you know, I'm describing all of these phylacteries. They don't have any idea what they are. I mean, they just think they're, like, remains. They check a couple. There's nothing in them. They're like, hmm. You know, the, the thing's still whipping around and soul's coming out. And it's like, the whole place feels like it's going to crash down on them. Oh, we'll go. There's a door over here. They go through the sw swirly, misty gate. Go through there. The whole place is still rumbling and trembling and everything. And, oh, what's back here? They go back and they find all the Nothics and they remember at least two of one of them, two of them, one of them, one or two of them remember what the Nothics are because they were in uh, Lost Mine of Fandelver. There was a Nothic. So they see the Nothic. He's like, fuck, I hate these guys. So um, they they talk to the Nothics and they try to get information out of them and they sweet talk them and they do all that. And the whole place is fucking, it's coming down. It's just craziness. It's like, a Sarerak should have came. A Sarerak should have came as soon as they destroy the Soulmonger. They didn't destroy the Soulmonger. They killed the Atrop. So I'm like, Psh. The whole place, the lava's rising up, like all of this, right? So they go back and they're looking around and they look down the room with the three paths and the secret doors and mm, they're scratching their head. What, what are we supposed to do? I can't figure out what we're supposed to do. We killed the baby. What more could we possibly do? Wait, let's go back to the big room again. So they go back into the big room, out of the misty gate, and they they see, like, the whole thing's got a big crack in it now. And there's souls shooting out of it. And the umbilical cord is still whipping around. And, like, the beams are getting, like, dissolved from the souls blowing out. It's like, you know, like a plasma cutter. And, like, the, the lava is now, it's raised all the way up to the to the surf to the to the bottom level to the ground level and is like bubbling up like the whole thing's like sinking down into the volcano and they're like okay i'm gonna try to figure out what's going on i'm gonna see if i can figure out what's going on and so we gave i gave them a whole bunch of rolls uh the bad rolls uh i said that they thought that they were freeing dindar the the night serpent the the, the eater of nightmares um <coughs> they didn't like that, <laughs> but they knew that they were bad roles, so they thought that that was probably metagaming. They probably they knew that was probably not what was going on. So uh, they the the people who had the good roles realized that 
all the souls are still caught in this giant device thing. So maybe, maybe the baby was just like a battery for the big device thing. Maybe the big device thing is the problem, not the baby. Maybe and they're like, we should destroy the big glowing thing, the big thing thing. So they start wailing on that thing and they're getting attacked by tentacles and they're fighting the tentacles and they're fighting the thing. And then, um, yeah, they pretty much destroyed it and dropped it. They, they, they figured out that they could attack the adamantine struts and they dropped the whole thing in the lava. And at that point, once they dropped it in the lava, I had a Sararak come out. And same deal with a Sararak. I left his spells the same. I was super concerned that the party was going to die. I posted in Reddit. I don't know how the party is going to survive. I, I don't see how they can survive fighting this lich. And they're like, their their level's fine. Like they're they're going to be fine. Like you should just sh shut up. You're stupid. I was like, but, dude, I, 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 this guy he's going to kill him. Like I I know exactly what I'm going to do. You know, I got a strategy figured out, and he's gonna he's gonna wipe him. And they were like, just play it. And if he wipes him, he wipes him, whatever. You know, they already saved the world. They'll be okay with it. So they go to fight a Sararak. You know, he comes through and they're all like, oh shit. I forgot that they all got 50 temporary hit points each from the gods possessing them. They all had gods possessing them. You unanimously, including the NPCs, decided that they needed the help of the trickster gods. So they all had 50 temporary hit points. I was like, 50 hit points, that's not a big deal. Every round. They have 50 hit points every round. What the... What? Who? Who thought... That's so much. Like the other buffs, whatever. They're like a really powerful magic item. 50 hit points per round? I I saw that and my heart sunk. I don't know why I hadn't realized that in all my preparation. Because I had so much time to prep prayer. I thought it was 50 hit points. I didn't think it was 50 hit points per turn. So they started to fight him, and he hits him with the the annihilation sphere, and he does this, and he does that, and he's he's knocking the the barbarian out of combat, you know, with a like an irresistible dancing or whatever, with a power word stun or whatever his spells are, you know, he's using his spells correctly. Like I'm I'm throwing deck saves at the druid. I'm throwing. You know, will saves at the the paladin. I'm throwing strength saves at the rogue. Like I'm I'm trying to play him smart. And they got through five rounds. It was like five rounds, and it was getting to be touch and go. So I was like, you know, you haven't seen the last of me. And he disappeared. So he te teleported away. He didn't disappear. He teleported away. So wherever he is, whatever he's doing, like it didn't kill him, but he's not there. And again, they saved the universe and all that. So uh, that was it. They got they they dug everything around. I don't even think they went and got the treasure. They just they just went back. They just went back through the tomb and out through the cracks because at that point they could, uh, you know, they could, they could, do, with Wayne's help, they could do gaseous form. And uh, I said, you know, a lot of the spells uh, were no longer affecting the tomb. So they were able to get out. Uh, I believe that's right. Oh, no, they had one of the, the rogue... I think, figured out the Oblisk. So before they fought a Sararak, he had touched the Oblisk and was outside. And they were like, whoa, 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 we don't want to do this. Yeah, so so the Rogue, I don't think, was in the final, final fight uh, against a Sararak.
but everybody else was. So, yeah, they had figured that out. So they touched the obelisk and they got outside, and that wasn't a big problem. Everybody had a great time. Lots of very kind words. Lots of everybody. It was, it was super exciting. Uh, you know, edge of the seat stuff. Um, you know, they were all excited to be playing at that high of a level. Uh, when they rested, I let them level. So that was the highest level any of them had ever played D&D. Um, they thought it was great. Uh, we finished exactly on time. Like everything went off without a hitch. It was really great. It was really great. Okay, so that's the whole session. Now, pros and cons of Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb of Annihilation is kind of long. All right, you basically have three parts. Um, you have Port Nye and Zaru and looking for help. You have uh, the jungle and the hex crawl and like all of the different little side adventures. I guess four parts. You have Omu. Omu takes a while. So Omu and Fane of the Night Serpent are really kind of like one big thing. And then, of course, the the, to, the Tomb of the Nine Gods, the Tomb. The, the tomb. Uh, Nye and Zaru was the hardest because it was very sandboxy. Uh, I felt like I prepared pretty well, and several times I was still a seat of the pants. The Hex Crawl, I used the DM Guild Supplement, the, the, the DM's Companion, I think it was called. It was great. Uh, I, I skipped a couple of days here and there I didn't necessarily like, but all in all, it really got into the campaign setting. It really told a lot of the... The story and the history, um, the my players chose side quests that did tell the story, and they were able to find their way to Omu and get the boons that they needed uh, to be successful. It went really well. Uh, I, I think the jungle can be a problem for a lot of people. I think a lot of DMs, for whatever reason, want to get through it quickly, or, I don't know, uh, a lot of the stuff I see online, people don't necessarily like the jungle, and uh, my group really liked the jungle, I, you know, we had, we had a, we had a druid, and then we had two druids, we had a lot of guides, maybe that was our, our saving grace, so we had like four guides, five guides. So between the five guides and our rogue and a druid in the party, we were doing great. They were never at a loss for food or water. They were they never had any trouble with the environment itself. Uh, the only one that was wearing any armor was Uriel the Elf, who I said had uh, Elven Chain. That was kind of like one of his, like whenever we very first started, when I very first made the character, that was one of the things that I gave him because he's, the, I explained it in backstory. And then the other one who had armor was Bo the Cleric, who had like artifact armor for being the chosen one of Jurgle. So he, I said, you know, it's made out of bone. It's made out of bones. So he didn't need to worry about it um, getting hot and and all of the other problems that you have. So those are the only guys wearing armor. Everybody else was, was armorless or, uh, you know, wearing robes and stuff. So we didn't have any of those difficulties. Uh, again, with so many guides and the characters got, like rolling for navigation and survival, we we only had like one time we took a misstep. All the other times we basically beelined from one point to the next. They would find out about a point and, and head there, and then they would find out about another point and head there. You know, like the guides wanted to go to their individual places. You know, uh, the one guides wanted to go to Flame Finger to get the mask, and then the other guides wanted to go to Needle Bones to to get the treasure. And then they, you know, it's like they were all kind of going different places. Um, they loved Eku. They, you know, I, I had tied in the backstory of the the druid 
with the little Vegapygmy um, to the Barbarian. Uh, so they liked him, even though <laughs> he was he was a difficult character. Uh, everything went really well with the jungle, as far as I was concerned. It could have been a little more difficult. The only thing they had trouble with was, uh, like, the stone golem on the bridge. There was the, br the ooh, ooh, ah, ah, or the mwahaha ha, ha bridge. That was the only thing that, like, they got really close to getting murped. But beyond that, I mean, it was going really well. So then you get to Omu. Omu went really well. The story was great. They tied it all together. You know, I feel like um, that feast at Curse of Ball really set the stage and everybody, like, got focused and was like, okay, here we go. Like, they kind of knew what they were going into, even though they didn't really know what they were going into. Um, it went really well. Fane of the Night Serpent kind of hand-waved that. They freed some slaves. They did some good stuff. They saw... Like an abomination of a of an unholy temple, and they're like, "Fuck this! Let's just go threaten the big guy and see if we can, if he'll just let us do our thing." It was I. There could have been more politics and intrigue, and like there could have been stuff happening in there, or it could have been like a huge fight, and wave after wave, and they're holding back these waves and trying to fight their way in. Like it could have went different ways, and it would have been a lot of fun. But I feel like the way that we did it was a lot of fun, and it gave Dayton, who was playing Bo the cleric, like probably his best shining moment. I wish that. The player Dayton could have been here for that last fight because that was, like, that's, I, how do you do better as a cleric? How do you do better as a, as a, as a cleric of the death god who's been sent on a holy mission to, to beg for help from your god to, to complete the mission and then get it? Like, it, w I wish he could have been here for that. So that was the character's crowning achievement, but I feel like the player's crowning achievement was confronting Ross Nassi and getting the cube from him. Then you get into the Tomb of the Nine Gods. We got into there. Pretty much everything went okay. Everything went all right. There were a couple, at least one time that I kind of had to explain the problem so that they were able to figure it out. Other than that, it played pretty well. Um, the Aboleth, they didn't re like they didn't mess with the Aboleth much. Uh, and I know like Puffin Forest and some other people, they tell great stories about the Aboleth, the the, the, the multiple personality Aboleth, and um. Yeah, I'm trying to think of anything. I know a couple of the of the Amuan uh, challenges were very tough, and some of them were really easy. And once we got into the tomb, the biggest problem was just not being able to rest. I think if I had to do it over, I would not let him kill Withers, especially now with Baldur's Gate 3. Oh my god, I would never let him kill Withers. Uh, but that was, you know, they killed him like a year before Baldur's Gate 3 came out. But, uh, yeah, they they found Withers' den and they confronted him and he was in there and I had in my mind that he was going to teleport away. <clears throat> Next round, he's going to try one more thing and then he's going to teleport and they, and they just totally killed him. So I feel like if Withers would have been there, he could have uh, harrowed them a little bit more. He could have, you know, I, I would have played the whites a little smarter. It would have been more challenging. So I could have done that differently, but I just kind of let the chips fall where they may. I let them kill Withers. I let them get the slod. The slod was huge for them. They were using the slod super effectively. The druid... The, the druid was running the slod, and the slod was just death on wheels. Like, it was just amazing. And it died in the, the, the annihilating hole. Like, it just jumped in and died. So, not only is there a lich, but there's also a, a death slod out there that doesn't like them. He's probably forgot about them by now. Highlights, definite highlights. There was a lot of great things. There was a lot of great things. Uh, I really, like I said, I don't think the 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 last 
after you destroy the Soulmonger and the Atropal, that last with the hallways and the curtains and the secret doors and there's a gold path. And a... <sighs> Come on. They've already gone through this whole thing and now you're fucking with them some more? Like you got more puzzles for them? Like what is this? Like what is this stuff? Why would he have this on the other side of the thing he's protect like it doesn't make sense like if anything he would just have a giant trap that he never went in there right like he would have the nothix and the altar and all of that stuff and then beyond that it just killed you right i mean why why would you have these traps and the treasures and the different like none of that made any sense to me so i guess that's probably the one thing it just seemed, you know, a hat on a hat. Like, they just said, oh, in case you wanted to do some more stupid, stupid, uh, non-intuitive uh, tricks and traps and rooms and stuff you don't need. I, I don't know. At that point, they had killed everything. They should have went in there and been congratulated and, and then, you know, been able to get back out, which is what I basically had my characters do my players do but overall great adventure great experience now i'm going to uh well we got to the end and i said you know what do we want to do do we want to keep playing do we want to start a new campaign like i can do stuff for these characters and, and go from here uh i can make uh like a homebrew i can do everything from scratch you know as long as we're still in D and D, I have i have multiple adventures that i've run before in previous editions that i can update or you know i just bought planescape do we want to play planescape and they were like planescape 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 so we're gonna play the quest from planescape and uh we took a couple months off so i could prepare for that so we're gonna play that tomorrow um yeah, I'm going to talk more about that in another video, but Tomb of Annihilation, good stuff, very fun, very good time. Um, I see why a lot of people said it's the best published adventure, even though I've only played like four or five different uh, published adventures for 5th edition, but I was really happy with it. Um, like I said, not a whole lot of negative notes, not a whole lot of bad stuff, mostly all good stuff. And... Uh, yeah, I think that's about all I got. I'm going to turn around and record another video about the setup for this next campaign. So, till next time, till, till, just, you know, click next or whatever. Um, workshop, your D&D &D buddy, and uh, game on.